Welcome to the Puritan and Reformed Audio Podcast. A reading from the 1609 version of John Downham's Christian Warfare, the first book, entreating of the power and policies of our spiritual enemies, and of the means how we may withstand the one and defeat the other. That all the godly are assaulted with the spiritual enemies of their salvation, chapter 1. The Apostle, having showed the mystery of our salvation and the causes thereof for the confirmation of our faith in the first chapters of his epistle to the Ephesians, and afterwards in the other chapters, having set down a number of duties both generally belonging to all Christians, and also particularly appertaining to men of a number of conditions, that he might move them to repentance and amendment of life, He next, like the Lord's sentinel, does discover and give us warning of the approach of mighty enemies, willing us to arm ourselves at all points in our own defense, and courageously to stand under the standard of Christ Jesus, that we may be continually in readiness to endure the encounter, chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, and so on. Whereby he gives us to understand that as soon as we seek for assurance of salvation in Christ, and endeavor to serve the Lord in a holy and a Christian life, we are to prepare ourselves for a combat, unless we would suddenly be surprised. For the spiritual enemies of our salvation bandy themselves against us as soon as we have given our names unto God, and taken upon us the profession and practice of Christianity, which are the lively and cognizance of our heavenly Lord and Master. And this is manifest by the example of God's children from time to time, who although they lived in peace and security before they were entertained into God's family, yet no sooner were they admitted to be of God's household servants, but Satan in the world has raged against them, laboring both by inward temptations and outward fury, either to withdraw them from God's service by flattering enticements, or utterly to destroy and overthrow them by open violence. No sooner had Abel offered a sacrifice of sweet-smelling savor unto God, but Satan stirs up Cain to become his butcher, whilst Moses was continued to be reputed the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He enjoyed all prosperity, but as soon as he joined himself to God's people in church, Pharaoh seeks his life. As long as the Israelites worshipped the Egyptian idols, they sat by their flesh pots in peace and quietly enjoyed the fruits of the land. But as soon as they made but a motion of serving the Lord, the king stirred up by the devil doth rage against them with more than barbarous cruelty. Whilst Paul persecuted the church of God, Satan did not so much trouble him either outwardly in body or inwardly in mind. But no sooner was he truly converted to the faith and preached the gospel, but presently he sets his wicked imps on work to take away his life, which the Lord not permitting, he moves them to persecute him by imprisoning, whipping, and stoning him, and not content with these outward afflictions, he sends his messengers to buffet him, that he might be no less vexed inwardly in mind than outwardly in body. Yea, he spared not our Savior Christ himself, but as soon as he began to show himself to be the Son of God, and Redeemer of mankind, and performing the duties of his calling, then especially he bendeth all his force against him, he tempts and assaults him forty days together, and taking the foil himself, he stirs up his wicked instruments to persecute him, at length to take away his life. Whosoever therefore resolves to be a servant of God must make account to be his soldier also. And while with Nehemiah's followers, with one hand they perform the works of their callings in Christianity, they must with the other hand hold their weapons to repel their spiritual enemies, who continually labor to hinder the Lord's buildings. For no sooner do we become friends to God, but presently Satan assaults us as his enemies. No sooner do we receive the Lord's press money and set foot into his camp, but Satan advances against us his flags of defiance, laboring both by secret treachery and outward force to supplant and overcome us. 
Here, therefore, is instruction for secure worldlings and consolation and encouragement for God's children. Worldly men, instead of fighting the Lord's battle, spend their time in chambering and wantonness, in lusts and uncleanness, in music and dalliance, in surfeiting and all voluptuousness, in covetousness and idleness, as though they were no enemy to assault them, and as if Satan were some meek lamb, and not a roaring lion ready to devour them. So that good Moses, coming near them, cannot hear the noise of them that have the victory, nor the noise of them that are overcome, but the noise of singing and merriment, for they are not fighting the battles of the Lord of hosts, but solemnizing a Sabbath to the golden calf, sitting down to eat and drink and rising up to play. The spiritual Canaanites are quite forgotten, and they remember not the blessed land of promise, whereunto like pilgrims they should be traveling, but make this world, this wilderness of sin, the place of their joy and delight. In a word, they flourish in their outward estates, and never in their minds feel any vexation of Satan's temptations. And what is the cause of all this? If he ask them, they will say that they have such a strong faith and peace of conscience that Satan's temptations have no power over them, neither were they ever troubled with any of his encounters. And not content with these brags of their own happy estate, they censor and condemn God's children accounting their state most desperate, who are molested with Satan's temptations, and go mourning under the burden of sin all the day long, supposing either that they are in Satan's power and have more grievously sinned than other men, or that they are mad and frantic so to vex themselves with such needless sorrows. But let such men know that of all others their state is most dangerous, for they are grievously sick and have no sense of their disease. Their wounds are so mortal that they deprive them of all feeling. They are assaulted, yea, taken prisoners, whilst they sleep soundly in security and discern not the approach of the enemy. They make no resistance because they are ignorant of the assault. And what can be more dangerous than to have the enemy approach and lay hands on us before we are aware? But this is the state of those men. For as one saith, they are most assaulted when they feel no assault. Let them know that they are not the Lord's soldiers, but the devil's revelers, and therefore he fighteth not against them, because they are his friends. For there was never any of Christ's soldiers in the militant church which have not been exercised in this warfare. There was ne never any so strong in faith, but Satan durst encounter him, even the apostles, yea, Adam in the state of innocency, yea, our Savior Christ himself. There were never any so constant in the course of Christianity, but the world has fought to draw them out of the right way by her baits of prosperity, or to force them to sin by threatening adversity. There were never any that have had in them one spark of God's Spirit, Christ accepted, who have not felt it assaulted and often followed by the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and they are contrary the one to the other, as it is said in Galatians 5, verse 17. Yea, the apostle Paul himself, when he was most sanctified, saw another law in his members, rebelling against the law of his mind, leading him to captivity to the law of sin, as appears in Romans 7:23. It is not, therefore, their strength of faith, but their carnal security which so lulls them asleep in the cradle of worldly vanities that they cannot discern this fight. It is not their peace with God nor the peace of conscience which makes them thus quiet. For there is no such peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Isaiah 57.21 but it is a peace which they have made with Satan, a covenant with death, and an agreement with hell, as a prophet speaks. Isaiah 28.15 When the strong man armed, Satan, quietly keeps the house, the things that he possesses are in peace. But when a stronger than he cometh to dispossess him, he will never lose his possession without a fight. And we cannot choose but feel the blows in so sharp an encounter. Luke 11, verse 21. If a man never enter the field to fight against Satan, or if at the first encounter he yield himself prisoner, and be content to be tied in the pleasing fetters of sin, 
It is no marvel that he does not rage in his conscience when as already he is in captivity ready to perform all those works of darkness wherein he employs him. But if when Christ the Redeemer is preached unto them by his ambassadors, they would show any desire of coming out of his thraldom, surely the spiritual Pharaoh would never lose their service but by force and compulsion. Neither can so strong a man be forced, but we must needs feel the conflict. While the prisoner lieth in the dungeon loaded with bolts and tied in chains, the keeper sleeps securely because he knows he is safe. But if his bolts be filed off and his chains loosed, he have escaped out of his prison. Then the jailer begins to bustle and pursues him speedily with a great cry. So while Satan holds us imprisoned in the dark dungeon of ignorance, loaded and tied with the heavy bolts and chains of sin, he is reckless and secure. But if our Savior by his ambassadors and the preaching of the word loose and unburden us of these chains and bolts, and by the light of his Spirit so illuminate the eyes of our understanding that we see the way out of Satan's dungeon of ignorance and so escape out of his captivity, then he rages against and pursues us as Pharaoh did the Israelites, that either he may bring us back again into his bondage or else destroy us if we make resistance. Lastly, they feel not any fight between the flesh and the spirit, because the flesh wholly rules them. And like a flood which as a clean current carries them wholly into a sea of sin, without any stop or resistance, and therefore no marvel they feel not this fight, when the spirit which is one of the combatants has no force nor residence in them. Secondly, God's children who continually feel the assaults of their spiritual enemies and see the breaches which are made to their souls with a continual battery of their temptations may receive no small consolation by this when as they consider that all who profess themselves God's servants and resolve to serve the Lord in holiness and righteousness are thus tempted and tried. For the dragon is wroth with the woman, that is God's church, and her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. As in Revelation 12.17 And like a roaring lion seeketh their destruction, because they have renounced him, and fight under the standard of the Lord of hosts, whom he maligns. And hence it is that whilst we live without sense of sin, we eat and drink and take our ease without disturbance. But after we make any conscience of our ways and endeavor to serve the Lord, then Satan casts against us the fiery darts of his temptations, and we feel many conflicts between the flesh and the spirit, with which the worldly man is never troubled. So that when we are thus tempted and assaulted by Satan, the world and our corrupt flesh, it is a strong argument to persuade us that we are entertained for God's soldiers and have received the press money of his spirit. For Satan's kingdom is not divided, neither doth he fight against those who are his friends and servants, but against those who wage war against him and fight under the Lord's standard. True it is that when his servants have committed such abominable and grievous sins, as have made deep wounds in their seared consciences, whereby they are awakened out of their sleep, lethargy of security, then Satan fills them with horror and despair that he may keep them from true repentance, when he can hide from them their sins no longer, and the Lord in his just judgment, and for the example of others, doth suffer Satan to begin in them the torments of hell in this life. But if he can by any means hide hide their sins, and keep them quietly in his kingdom, he will never vex them. And hence it is that whereas one perishes through despair, many thousands perish through presumption and security. Let all those, therefore, who feel the burden of their sins, and are vexed with the continual assaults of their spiritual enemies, comfort themselves. For by this they have assurance that they are the members of the church militant, into which none but soldiers are entertained, and that now they begin to be God's friends and servants when as Satan opposes himself against them. Chapter 2 Why God Allows His Servants to Be Exercised in the Spiritual Conflict of Temptations but there it may be demanded why the Lord will suffer his servants to be thus tempted and assaulted, whereas the wicked are free from such conflicts. I answer first for his own glory, 
For whereas our enemies are strong and mighty, and we weak and feeble, hereby is the Lord's omnipotent power manifested to all the world, by whose assistance such impotent wretches conquer and subdue such furious and and persistent enemies. Secondly, God suffers his children to be tempted, that so those spiritual graces which he has bestowed upon them may the more clearly shine to his glory. For who can know whether they be God's golden vessels before they be brought to the touchstone of temptation? Who can know the faith, patience, and valor of God's soldiers if they always lay quietly in garrison and never came to the skirmish? Who could feel the odoriferous smell of these aromatical spices if they were not puned and bruised in the mortar of afflictions? For example, who could have discerned Abraham's faith, David's piety, Job's patience, Paul's courage and constancy if they had never been tempted, which now to the glory of God shine to all the world? And as the Lord suffers Satan and his imps to try his children for his own glory, so also for their spiritual and everlasting good. For first by this he chastises them for their sins past, and reveals them to their remembrance, and so they may truly repent of them. And this causes Job to speak, Thou writest, he says, bitter things against me, and makes me to possess the iniquities of my youth. Job 13.26 Secondly, by this he manifests unto us our secret and hidden sins, which the blind eyes of our judgment would not discern, if their sight were not quickened with the sharp water of temptation. For so long as we live in peace, our secure consciences never summon us to the bar of God's judgment. But when we are roused up by temptation, we enter into a more straight examination of ourselves, and search what secret sins lie lurking in the hidden corners of our hearts, and so we may repent of them and make our peace with God without whose assistance we can have no hope to stand in any temptation. Thirdly, the Lord by this prevents our sins to come. For when we have experienced that the most sharp weapons which Satan uses to inflict deep wounds on our consciences are our sins, this will make us most careful to abstain from them, lest by this we strengthen him for our overthrow. And as these temptations of Satan are in this regard so many bridles to restrain us from sin, so also they are so many pricks to let out the wind of vain glory. By this, like bladders, we are puffed up, as we may see in the example of Paul, who, lest he should be exalted out of measure through the abundance of revelation, received a prick in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet him, Second Corinthians 12, verse 7. Fourthly, the Lord suffers Satan to assault us, that we may by this come to the sight of our own weakness and infirmities, when we have received many foils, and learned to rely upon his help and assistance in all our dangers. For so proud we are by nature, that before we come to the fight, we think that we can repel the strongest assaults, and overcome all enemies which oppose themselves against us by our own power, when we see ourselves vanquished and foiled with every small temptation, we learn to have a more humble conceit of our own ability, and to be dependent wholly upon the Lord. And this end is set down in Deuteronomy 8 verse 2 and 13 verse 3. Fifthly, the Lord permits Satan continually to assail us with his temptations to the end we may continually buckle unto us the whole armor of God that we may be ready for the battle. For as those who have no enemies to encounter them cast their armor aside and let it rust, because they are secure from dangers. But when the enemies are at hand and sound the alarm, they both wake and sleep in their armor ready for the assault. So if we should not continually skirmish with our spiritual enemies, we would lay aside the spiritual armor. But when we have continual use of it both day and night, we keep it fast buckled unto us, that being armed at all points we may be able to make resistance that we be not surprised at unawares. Lastly, by this conflict the Lord strengthens and increases all his graces in us. For as by exercise the strength of the body is preferred and augmented, and in short time and in short time decays through idleness and sloth. So the gifts of God's Spirit, faith, hope, patience, peace, and the rest, languish in us if they be not exercised with temptations. 
For tribulation bringeth forth patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, as it is in Romans 5, 3, and Romans 4, 5. For when once we have been tempted and tried, and the Lord has mercifully delivered us from the temptation, afterwards being so assaulted, we patiently endure it, hoping for the Lord's assistance, believing and assuring ourselves that the Lord who has delivered us will again deliver us, as it is in Psalm 27, 9. Moreover, when we see the great need of the graces of God's Spirit, this will be a strong motive to entice us to be a careful use of all good means in which we may attain unto them. Whereas if we were free from the spiritual conflict, we should not so clearly see nor apprehend the use and necessity of them. Chapter 3 Arguments in which we may be encouraged to enter into the spiritual conflict. As thus have I showed that all that will be God's servants must fight his battles against his and our spiritual enemies, and the causes why the Lord presses us to the service. Now that we may go courageously into the field, let us consider of some reasons and motives which may make us resolute and valiant. The first is the justness of our cause. For though soldiers be never so strong and well furnished, yet if their consciences tell them that they fight in a bad quarrel, it will much abate their courage and make them cowardly and timorous. But our cause is most just and our war most lawful. For God, who is justice itself, has proclaimed it by his heralds, the apostles. Ephesians 6.10 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the assaults of the devil. In James 4.7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. In 1 Peter 5.8, be sober and watch, for your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour whom resist steadfast in the faith. Secondly, the cause of our war is of great weight, is namely for the glory of God and our own salvation. For in all Satan's skirmishes he seeks to impeach God's glory with false imputations, and to bring us to utter destruction. And this may appear by his first conflict with our mother, Eve, Genesis 3, 4, and 5, where he accuses God of a lie, whose truth itself, and of impotency and disdain, saying that the cause why he did forbid them to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not, as he said, because they should die, but because he knew that when they should eat thereof, their eyes should be open, and they should be as gods, knowing good and evil. Where first he seeks to dim the beams of God's glory by accusing him of a lie and to persuade them that he was not omnipotent, sin that he was not able to hinder them from being gods, if they tasted of this fruit. Lastly, that he therefore forbade them to eat thereof because he envied them so glorious an estate. And secondly, he labors to destroy our first parents both body and soul by tempting them to disobedience and transgression of God's commandment. And therefore our Savior Christ in John 8.44 does very fitly join these two together, saying that he was a liar and a manslayer from the beginning, a liar in that he falsely accused God of lying, a manslayer because he did it to this end that he might murder our first parents and all their posterity, both body and soul, so that you see that the end of Satan's fight is to regard of God's glory which should be more dear unto us than our own souls, or any respect of our own salvation, if we would not treacherously betray them both by our slothfulness or cowardice into the hands of gods and our enemy. Let us valiantly enter into the field and never cease our courageous fight till we have obtained a full victory. The second reason to move us to undertake this fight is a profit which will accrue unto us by it. For if the getting of some booty and prize, or the receiving of some trifling pay, will move the soldiers of earthly princes to undergo all dangers, and with wonderful peril of life to fight even at the cannon's mouth, how much more should the stipend of our heavenly king move us to fight this combat, how terrible soever it seems so to flesh and blood? For first that it is truly here verified, peace is the daughter of war, Neither can we sooner enter the field to fight against these enemies, but presently we shall have peace with God, and soon after the fruit thereof the peace of conscience. 
Whereas if we betray God's cause to Satan and our souls to sin, well, may we be lulled asleep in carnal security, but we shall never enjoy this peace with God and peace of conscience. For there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Isaiah 57, 21. And whosoever has taken this treacherous truth with Satan shall find that he will break it for his best advantage, if not in the whole course of their lives, yet at the house of death, when as they shall be able to make no resistance. Secondly, if we fight against these enemies and valiantly overcome, the Lord has promised to give us to eat of the tree of life, which is in paradise, and the manna that is hid, and that he will write our names in the book of life, Revelation and that he will in this life bestow on us all his spiritual graces, and in the life to come replenish us with such joys as neither eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man conceived. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 Let us therefore strive that we may overcome. Our labor is but short, but our reward shall be eternal. On the other side, if we consider Satan's pay which he gives unto his soldiers, we shall find that it is nothing but the pleasures of sin for a season, and in the end everlasting death and destruction of body and soul. For the wages of sin is death, it is uh, Romans 6.23 who therefore is so slothful and cowardly that would not be encouraged to fight the Lord's battles against our spiritual enemies with such promises made by him who is truth itself and cannot deceive us? Who is so desperate and foolhardy as to fight under Satan's banner, seeing the pay which he gives us everlasting death and utter confusion? The third reason to move us to this fight is the honor which will accompany this victory. For if earthly soldiers will purchase honor with the loss of life, which is nothing else but the commendation of the prince, or applause of the vain people, what hazard should we not undergo in fighting the spiritual combat, seeing our grand captain, the Lord of hosts, and infinite multitudes of blessed angels look upon us and behold our combat, whose praise and approbation is our chief felicity? What peril should we fear to obtain a crown of glory which is promised to all that overcome and to become heirs apparent of God's kingdom? On the other side, the shame and confusion of faith which shall overtake them who cowardly forsake the Lord's standard and yield unto Satan, when as they shall not dare to look the Lord in the face whose cause they have betrayed, should serve as a strong motive to encourage us to the fight. The fourth reason to persuade us is the necessity of undertaking this combat. There is no man so cowardly that will not fight when there is hope in flight, no mercy to be expected in the enemy, no outrage and cruelty which will not be committed. But such is our enemy that we cannot possibly flee from him. His malice is unreconcilable, his cruelty outrages, for he fights not against us to the end that he may obtain sovereignty alone abridge us of our liberty, spoil us of our goods, but he aims at our death and destruction of body and soul. If therefore we so carefully arm ourselves against earthly enemies, who when they have done their uttermost rage can but shorten a miserable life, how much more carefully should we resist this enemy who seeks to deprive us of everlasting life and to plunge us into an ever-dying death? Secondly, this fight is unnecessary because in our baptism we have taken a military sacrament and promised faithfully unto the Lord that we will continually be his faithful soldiers unto the end fighting his battles against the flesh the world and the devil there we have given our names unto Christ to whom we owe ourselves and lies by a double right both because he gives them unto us and also restored them the second time when we had lost them there we were put in mind of his bloodshed for our redemption, which should encourage us to fight courageously that we may be preserved from falling again into the cruel slavery of sin and Satan. Thirdly, unless we fight the spiritual combat and in fighting overcome, we shall never be crowned with a crown of glory, for it is not given unto any to triumph who have not fought valiantly and subdued their enemies. The everlasting peace of God's kingdom is not promised to such cowards as never entered the field, or being entered have presently yielded themselves to be the captives of Satan, but unto those that fight courageously and gloriously overcome. If any man, says the apostle, strive for a mastery, 
He is not crowned except he strive as he ought to do. 2 Timothy 2 verse 5. So the Apostle James in chapter 1 verse 12 pronounces a man blessed that endures temptation for when he is tried, or rather as the words are, when by trial he shall be found approved, he shall receive a crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Whereby it appears that none are crowned unless they strive as they ought, and therefore much less they who strive not at all, that none are blessed but those who are tempted, and being tempted endure the temptation, that first we must be tried and by trial approved before we can receive the crown of life. Lastly, we may be encouraged to this fight by certain hope of victory, for we fight under the standard of Christ Jesus, who alone is mightier than all our enemies that assault us. If we did indeed regard our enemy's strength and our own weakness only, we might well be discouraged from undertaking this combat. But if we look upon our grand captain Christ, whose love towards us is no less than his power, and both infinite, there is no cause of doubting, for he that exhorts us to the fight will so help us that we may overcome. When we faint, he sustains us and crowns us when we overcome. He has already overcome our enemies to our hand, and has cooled their courage and abated their force. He has bruised the serpent's head, so that he shall not be able to overcome the least of his followers. He may hiss against them, but he cannot hurt them, for his sting is taken away. Satan was a strong man who possessed all in peace, but our Savior Christ, who was a stronger than he, coming upon him, hath overcome him, and taken from him all his armor, in which he trusted, and divided his spoils. Luke 11:21 and 22. We fought against mighty enemies and great potentates, Ephesians 6:12. but our Savior has spoiled principalities and powers, and made a show of them openly, and has triumphed over them upon the cross, Colossians 2:15. And so through death has destroyed him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, that he might deliver all them which for fear of death were all their life subject to bondage. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. He was indeed a mighty prince of this worldly Canaan, but our Joshua hath subdued him, and has left nothing for us to do who are his soldiers and followers, but to tread in his neck in token of victory. But we, alas, are faint-hearted, like the firstborn of Gideon, Judges 8, 20, and 21. For though our Savior Christ has conquered these our spiritual enemies, and has put the sword of his Spirit into our hands, wherewith we might also vanquish them, yet we are afraid to draw the sword, because we are but fresh water soldiers, and white-livered. And therefore we had need to encourage ourselves, not only by looking on the victory of our chief captain, but also on the conquest of our fellow soldiers who are weak and frail like ourselves. So likewise Christ has overcome the world and wills us to be of good comfort, seeing that we shall be partakers with him in his triumph. If we will join with him in his fight, John 16:33. And though our flesh be a treacherous enemy and stronger to us than the spirit, yet so we will fight against the lust thereof. We shall be sure of victory, for he will assist us with his Holy Spirit, and therewith enable us more and more to mortify this old man and body of sin. Well, may we take a foil in the spiritual combat, but the Lord will raise us up again. For though we fall, yet shall we not be cast off, because the Lord putteth under his hand, as it is in Psalm 37:24, And the Lord has promised that he will not suffer us to be tempted above our power, but will give the issue with the temptation that we may be able to bear it, as it is in 1 Corinthians 10:13, And he that has promised is faithful and true, yea, truth itself, and therefore he will be as good as his word. Though therefore Satan encounter us with all fury, let us not be faint-hearted but courageously endure his assaults and so in the end of the victory it will be ours for if we resist the devil he will flee from us james four seven if we fight the lord's battles valiantly the god of peace shall tread satan under our feet shortly as it is in romans sixteen verse twenty for the promise of bruise in the serpent's head made by the Lord, Genesis 3.15, doth belong not only to Jesus Christ our head, but also to all those who are members of his body. Let us not therefore fear to fight against beaten and conquered enemies, slothfully pretending our weakness to withstand 
these sons of Anakim, for as one saith, Every one shall be a conqueror who desires to conquest. For if we will be the Lord's soldiers, he will not suffer himself to be so much disgrace as to let us be overcome by his mortal enemies. He hath armed us himself with his own armor, and sent us out to fight his battles, and therefore we will not have us vanquished, being fortified with his strength. For so should himself be overcome in us, and his weapons should be esteemed weak and insufficient. Yea, he has engrafted us into his own body, and we are lively members of it. And therefore let us never think that all the power of hell shall be able to overcome us. For what head can with patience suffer his sound members to be pulled from his body, if he be able to defend them?